Okay, good morning. The title of this conversation is The Simple Joy of Eating Well, Rediscovering a Friendly Relationship with Food. So joining me on stage, we have uh, Jose Porro, Karen Lobillon, and Ginny Laracy. Jose is the Director of Information Technologies. He's worked for many large firms, including IBM, Marriott International, Blue Cross Blue Shield. He specializes in business intelligence, and he's currently responsible for the, the analysis and design team of the largest healthcare data warehouse in the US, with over 100 million members and several billion claims. Ginny Laracy has worked as a therapist in New York and New Jersey for the past 12 years. She received her master's degree in social work from New York University and a BA in Spanish at Marquette. Ginny also completed the Women Therapy Center's program in eating and body image problems. She's been a therapist in the eating disorder day treatment programs at the Renfrew, Renfrew Center and Columbus Park Collaborative. Ginny's run therapy groups on intuitive eating for adults, and she's taught classes on body image and body acceptance to adolescents. She presently works in a therapy group in New Jersey that specializes in grief and end of life issues. Karen LeBillon is a professor at the University of British Columbia. She is a Rhodes Scholar with a PhD from Oxford. Her work has appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, The Guardian, The Sunday Times, The Observer, and The Huffington Post, as well as being featured on Good Morning America. Karen has received multiple awards, including Canada's Top 40 Under 40 and the Taste Canada Food Writing Award. She was proud to be a Jamie Oliver Food Foundation Real Food Advocate. Karen is the author of French Kids Eat Everything and Getting to Yum, both published by HarperCollins. So we thank them for, for joining us today. As I was gonna say, the, 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 the title of this conversation, The Simple Joy of Eating Well, Rediscovering a Friendly Relationship with Food. It could be said that hunger, hunger, is a person's initial response to reality, if we think about it. We're introduced into the world through hunger, which we feel. We're introduced into the world of relationships, family relationships, through hunger, right, at the mother's breast. Hunger is one of our primary responses to reality. And the fulfillment of hunger is probably the simplest of all of the desires and needs that come out of a person, the simplest to satisfy, right? And so this, this desire, this need to be fed, persistent, daily, right, so simple, and yet so profound. We all love to eat. We all desire to eat well. And yet, do we, in our daily eating and drinking, whether our families are at work or alone, do we experience joy, a simple joy of being fed? So if hunger is such a simple need, and if satisfying hunger is such a simple operation, then why is it that more people don't experience joy, right, joy in their daily eating and drinking? The philosopher Aristotle once said, he said, it's slavish to desire to live and not to live well. Could it be that the complication is in this difference, the difference between eating and eating well? So what does it mean to eat well? For some of us, this means to eat healthily. So, for instance, we, we're told to eat lean proteins, complex carbohydrates, we eat our omega-3 acids, antioxidants, right? But who finds joy in omega-3 acids? <laughs> <laughs> or we're told to eat ethically, okay? So we spend more for free range, for non-GMO, for uh, a fair trade, for local sourced food. And yet this also cannot bring joy in the sense of daily eating and drinking. And so what does it mean then to eat well? Are we missing something? So maybe it could be for many of us that food, either in its abundance or its quality, is not the issue, but rather our relationship to it. Many people are estranged from the food they eat or the way in which they eat it. Or many people, for various reasons, have an inimical relationship uh, to their food that they eat. And so what does it mean for us to experience the joy of, of meeting this basic uh, uh, desire that arises from our confrontation with reality, what does it mean to rediscover a friendly relationship with food? So I'm going to turn it over first to Mr. Jose Porto. Thank you uh, for that introduction. Um, I'd like to start 
with explaining why I did not have a friendly relationship with food and how I ended up uh, rediscovering that relationship. Um, I'd like to start with my earliest, earliest memory. Uh, when I was six years old, I was out grocery shopping with my mother uh, at the local grocery store uh, when, as we were in the checkout line, I collapsed. And uh, they rushed me to the hospital. They didn't know what was wrong with me. I had a, um, they thought I had appendicitis, so they took out my appendix, realized that wasn't it. So they kept me in the hospital for a month trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Um, never really quite understood what was wrong with me. Let me go. Um, then a couple years later, at the age of eight, again, I collapsed, again in the hospital, this time a little more seriously. Uh, and they uh, removed part of my intestine uh, that had gangrene because um, it had taken so long before they, they understood what was going on. Um, so I was having a lot of issues at that time. And as I grew up, the more I ate, the more sick I got um, and couldn't figure out why. So it was very difficult for me in terms of eating. Um, if I ate, I got sick. So my answer was stop eating or eat as little as possible. Um, and that, that became more and more difficult because obviously you can't live without eating. So <laughs> I had to eat. But then I had to figure out how could I eat so that when I ate, I could be sick and not around other people. Um, that meant that going through school, uh, getting teased and bullied because I would spend too much time in the bathroom after, after lunch and uh, my parents had to make special arrangements with the teacher so that I could go to the bathroom um, freely. And so that meant that I was a teacher's pet, so I got bullied. So it was not, not a fun growing up experience um, because of food. As I talked to the doctors about this growing up, uh, they had lots of theories. So one theory was that I had ulcerative colitis. Another theory was that I had Crohn's disease, um, that I had irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so they decided, well, let's put you on a low roughage diet because obviously it's all that fiber that's cutting you up inside and, and we need to solve it that way. So, the, so basically I stopped eating vegetables and fruits uh, and uh, I had a wonderful junk food diet. <laughs> and I loved my junk food diet, except for the fact that I got sick. Um, but as my junk food diet evolved, I ate more pasta, more bread, more soft foods, no, as little fiber as possible, and I kept getting sicker. Uh, by the time um, I was in my 30s, I was spending one to two weeks uh, a year in the hospital, um, where I would, basically my intestines would shut down and. And, and that was it, and I had to spend a week until they reopened and, and I could go back home. Um, into my 40s, now this was increasing, and I was more regularly in the hospital, so it was, it was definitely taking its toll. Um, so that was one of the problems. Uh, I think that the doctors didn't understand, I think that the connection to food um, and health is something that the doctors don't always um, think about, and, you know, the, most doctors are, are trying to connect um, your symptom to a process, a procedure or medication, but they don't really focus on the aspect of food and how that might impact your, your health. Um, so as a result, I was prodded, poked, and done lots of uh, things to me by doctors and never figured it out. Uh, and then things changed. About six years ago, I met my wife, who's here with me. And thanks to her, she was already on, the, on a healthy diet approach. She was juicing, she was uh, eating very well, um, all the things you said, non-GMO, all, all that good stuff, <laughs> all good stuff. Um, and so she wanted me to start eating healthier. And I kept explaining to her, but you have to understand, I can't eat roughage. I can't eat vegetables. That's bad. Um, but she got me to try one day uh, a dish that I had never had, uh, a quinoa. It's a wonderful grain. Um, unfortunately, 
that put me in the hospital for a week. <laughs> so you may be wondering why am I still with her after she put me in the hospital. Um, and I swore to her I would never eat this thing called quinoa again. Um, but we got over that, which is good. Um, what, what happened next was uh, she went on a diet uh, that basically eliminated pasta and anything that had wheat in it that was, as part of the diet. And she coaxed me into going into the diet with her. So I was like, all right, we'll give this a try. And for the next two or three months, I felt great. I was like, wow, this is different. Um, and the, for me, that wasn't really the turning point. The turning point was about at the three month mark, I was uh, in an all day meeting and they just rolled in some pizza and said, you know, we're not leaving, keep it, eat the pizza and we're gonna keep the meeting going. And so I ate the pizza. Two days, I couldn't leave the bed. I was like, and that's when I realized there's something here. There's something about this wheat thing that must be the problem. And so at that point, I started changing my diet. Um, and as a result, uh, through a friend, uh, we were introduced to a doctor who understood uh, some of these uh, eating problems, um, the food problems, I should say, and the connection to the health. Uh, and so thanks to uh, that, I started changing my diet and understanding a little bit about how the connection happens. And then I started eating again. I started eating well. Uh, I put on a little weight, but, um, but that's under control. The, uh, I just wanted to check my notes here. So as part of that process, now that I, I started changing my diet and, and going to the doctors, uh, one of the things my wife said um, is we should uh, go to the farmer's market and, and check out eating more fresh food and everything. But what, what was interesting to me was not buying the food at the farmer's market, but was actually meeting the farmers. Um, and I started developing a relationship with the farmers. And then I learned something new about food. The farmers taught me um, how it's grown and what the connection is. And they, they uh, explained to you some of the benefits uh, of each particular food. Uh, their connection to food is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, how the farmers live their life, and I mean, they live the food every day. Uh, and so we actually started visiting the farmers at the farms. We had them over to the house. Uh, and then we started another level of education. And then we started watching documentaries and, and things about food. And we really became um, very educated on the, on the topic of food. Uh, and it really has allowed me to have a much better relationship with food. Uh, so I want to just uh, uh, conclude here in my brief speech in that as a child, um, I hated food, and the food drove me basically because of the, the illnesses into somewhat of an isolation. Mm -hmm. um, it was difficult to be around people because I was sick and eating was, was a problem and I would get teased or bullied, so I withdrew. And, uh, and what was amazing to me in, in, in the story um, of my life is that it is through the relationships um, with people first that allowed me to build a relationship with food. Um, it was a relationship with my wife. It was a relationship uh, with the farmers, um, Mary Ellen, Annette, Bev, these are all farmers that, that gave me new information, gave me uh, more than anything, their friendship. And through that, I, I learned a lot. And I thought that was f uh, fantastic. It was through uh, Dr. Kogan, the doctor who um, in many ways saved me again because he, he taught me about my health issues and taught me how to think about it. So that today, I can eat well, I have some restrictions that I have to pay attention to so that I don't get sick, but I can eat well. And, and I can actually enjoy eating and I can go out and have that sense of joy that of, um, last night we were with my godfather and we had this beautiful uh, bronzini fish and you know, I, I was happy to be able to mm. eat fish uh, and share the meal with, uh, with my wife and, and my godfather. So 
Um, and in case anybody's wondering, I do eat quinoa now, so. <laughs> <laughs> You've been rehabilitated. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good, wonderful, thank you. Why don't we turn now to, to, uh, to Ginny Laracy. Thank you. Um, yeah, and it's interesting because it's gonna, what Jose said is gonna tie in to what I'm gonna talk about. Um, you know, I have a, I've worked a long time with people with eating disorders, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna call them eating problems or problematic eating, because I find that disorder, it sounds more judgmental, it sounds a little more critical, where if we can look at the way someone eats as problematic, we can be curious about it. We can start to understand why they're eating in that way. So I'm gonna give three examples today, three stories of people and their journey through their eating problems. But I wanna say that most eating problems begin um, I think for three reasons. The first is there's some sort of emotional disconnect that comes along, so it might be something from their family, they might suffer some sort of trauma, and that makes the person disconnected from their own emotions, their own feelings, um, disconnected from other people. The second is a physical disconnect that takes place where someone can either ignore their hunger or eat way beyond their hunger or not listen to their body in a way. And the third is um, a denial of reality or denial of acceptance of how someone looks, of what their body can handle, um, of what their body can do. And uh, the way these play out with people with eating problems, um, it often becomes a metaphor, and I'll explain more as I go through the three people. But for everyone here, even though maybe you don't have what would be called an eating disorder or an eating problem, um, I think a lot of people today, in today's world, engage in problematic eating. They're not listening to themselves, they're not connected to the food, they're maybe eating on the go, they're in the car shoveling it in their mouth, there's a family sitting around and everyone's on their iPhone. People aren't connecting to one another, people aren't connecting to the food, um, and people aren't connecting to themselves. And also, you know, this is the New York encounter, I feel like, we have to also talk about God. If people aren't connecting to all these things, they're also not maybe connecting to God in a deeper way. Um, so I guess I'll start by talking about a young woman named Marie. And I changed all names because I'm a therapist and I have to keep confidentiality um, in mind. Marie came to me when I worked at a day treatment program, the Renfrew Center here in New York City. And she came when she was in her early 20s Marie was from an um, Irish Catholic family, raised in Queens, and her mother had been very sick with cancer. And Marie really took on, she quit college, she took on caring for her mother. And she had a father who was a police officer and two brothers. And even though her mother was sick, dying of cancer, they didn't tell anyone. They kept it really within the family. It was almost like they were ashamed or embarrassed. They just didn't want to share. They didn't want to share what was going on. And that was really the family culture. So Marie really learned to be disconnected from her emotions. She was traumatized, her mother was dying, she was taking care of her. And even her father was working, her brothers were disconnected. There was no sense of family or community around her mother while she was dying. Her mother eventually passed away and Marie at this point was already restricting her food and her restriction got worse. Um, so I just want to say a little note about restriction. Lots of times when someone has an eating problem, it's a metaphor for how they relate in the world. So if you think about restriction, even if we say restriction, someone who restricts their food, they also restrict people. They keep people at bay. They push people away. They don't trust people. They want to isolate themselves. They do the same thing with the food. They don't trust the food that's going to come into their body, so they keep it out. It's a way to control. Maybe something happened to them emotionally that wanted them, made them want to isolate, and they do the same thing with the food as a way to make themselves feel safe. So this is what Marie was doing with the food to a point where she was almost passing out. You know, she was cooking meals for her family, but she wouldn't eat them. She would go for a 10-mile run and then come home. You know, she was doing this sort of behavior. But her aunt eventually got her into our program, and. Um, I worked at a day treatment program, like I said, and we did individual therapy, group therapy, 
Um, and probably one of the most important things we did is we would eat breakfast and lunch with all the patients. And then after we ate a meal with them, we would talk about it. And they would have to talk about how they felt sitting with the food inside of them, which really is an amazing thing if you talk about connection. How many of you have a meal and then you sit down and say, oh, how does, how does that feel? Maybe Jose, you have had that experience. <laughs> I would say. Quite a bit. <laughs> not, maybe not everyone in this audience has had that experience where you actually sit with what you just ate and say, oh, this feels uncomfortable, or that felt really good, or I feel nourished, or you know, any other feelings that would come up. So through our work together, Marie was in the program for maybe three or four months. She would come in, she would eat the meals, they would make her uncomfortable, but she would talk about it, and she learned how to physically reconnect to food again. Mm. We also did therapy groups. While Marie had trouble expressing herself to her family, to her friends, I don't know if anyone's ever been in a therapy group, or there's probably therapists in the audience who have run groups, but it's kind of a, it's an opportunity for people to express their feelings to one another so that they can then learn how to feel comfortable expressing in their family lives, in their lives outside. So through that, Marie also learned how to stand up for herself within the group, say what she me meant, say what she felt, and these few months gave her a safe place while she put weight back on her body, you know, to, to start to live a full life again, to start to live a connected life. So Marie eventually left our program, stayed in individual therapies, stayed with a nutritionist, you know, that, that helped her kind of do her meal planning, because it can be hard when you've been disconnected from your food for so long to know how to feed yourself. Um, and Marie went back to school, kind of got back in touch with friends that she had lost connections with, and also started opening up more to her father and brothers. Um, so that's Marie's story of restriction. Next, I'm going to talk about uh, Jesse, who came to us um, around the same time as Marie, actually. But her you know, food behavior was binging and purging. Um, so when I say binging, I mean lots of times someone who takes part in this, they might eat 2,000 calories in one sitting and then either throw up or overexercise or do something else to get rid of the food. So that metaphor in that case, is, it's, it's often like they feel like their needs are so much that they just need to take and take and take and take, but then they feel guilty or rejected or uncomfortable, so they get rid of whatever they just took in. That's how the metaphor plays out. But for Jessie, when she came in, again, same program, so she had to learn how to feed herself in a normal way, how to sit with the food, and we would talk about it. But the one thing that was really interesting for her, so she came to the groups and she engaged very easily. Lots of times someone who restricts comes to the groups and they don't talk, as you can imagine. But someone who um, binges and purges often has no problem talking and also taking from the group. Again, it's all the metaphor. Um, but she really had trouble stopping her symptoms when she wasn't in the group. So what she would do is she would call my work voicemail in the middle of the night when she felt like she was about to uh, act out a symptom, as we would call them, a binging or purging. And through that process, through talking to my voicemail or writing down in a journal, she started to understand the emotional reasons for what she was doing. She started to reconnect to the emotional, um, you know, maybe if she was feeling unsafe, if she was feeling upset. Um, she had parents who were divorced and they would often put her in the middle. So if she was feeling frustrated with them, that would come out and she was feeling it instead of actually going to do the symptom, to binge and purge. And this really allowed her to stop binging and purging because she was in touch with what she was actually feeling. She didn't have to go to this physically chaotic place um, that can also be, really it's very, I don't know, violence kind of a strong word, but it, it is kind of violent action to do to your own body. It's almost like someone cutting or someone else drinking too much or engaging in some other risky behavior. So by getting in touch with her emotions and back in touch with herself, um, she was able to heal that and she went on to, she had already graduated college, but she went on to have like a pretty successful job and she mended the relationship with her parents. Um, 
also, you know, she was able to accept that her parents weren't perfect. I would say that a big piece of this, too, when people have eating problems is that they, they want things to go a certain way, maybe. And the reality is, is that things aren't going to go a certain way. People are who they're going to be, and we have to learn to accept them. We can't control the situation. So Jessie really had to also learn to accept her parents for who they were and her situation for what it was. Um, and her body for what it was, which will lead me into my last example too. Um, but I, you know, also when people have eating problems, there's a lot of lack of body acceptance. Either their family members maybe didn't accept them or they don't feel accepted by society or they don't really feel connected to themselves or accept themselves. Um, so that brings me to my last person who is Francine. And she came to me through an intuitive eating group she um, was from Brazil and was a woman who, you know, depending on society's standards, I thought she was beautiful. She was very curvaceous, very voluptuous. But according to her standards for herself, or maybe the standards in Brazil or the standards for our modern day, she felt like she was fat. She was overweight. And she had always had a body like that. Growing up in Brazil, she a big family, I think there were five kids, and she had three brothers and another sister who was a little, little tiny twig, and her mother gave Francine different food rules. You know, well, Francine, you can't eat this, you have to eat this. They can eat that, because they're skinny and they're boys, but you cannot do that. So she started binge eating. And the metaphor for binge eating is you just stuff in, stuff in your feelings. Take it all in, take it all in, and don't express, um, because that feels safer. It feels safer to almost punish yourself with food than to express how you feel. So that's what Francine did. Um, she came to an intuitive eating group, intuitive eating group that I ran. And intuitive eating is basically eating when you're hungry, stopping when you're full, and listening to what your body wants to eat, which seems really simple when we say it. But it's very hard to do, because people do walk around with lots of chatter in their head about the omega-3s and the this and that, and it was low fat, then it was high protein. You know, It's always changing, and people walk around with that in the back of their mind instead of listening to themselves and listening to their bodies. So through the intuitive eating group, Francine learned how to feed herself you know, when she was hungry and stopping when she was full and listening to herself. And she also learned how to, it gave her language to go back home to Brazil and say, no, mom, I'm, I'm listening to myself now. You can't put these rules on me. Granted, she was like 30 by this point, but it can still, <laughs> you know, it's an ever-changing relationship with your parents as you get older. Um, she could say to her, no, these rules don't apply. These rules don't apply. She was binging out of anger at her mother or at the society or whoever told her that her body was not quite right. Um, so, but once, and, and she also, I would say, started um, going to yoga and starting meditating, started praying a lot, and she found what her body could do, um, and she accepted her body for what it looked like, and she stopped binging. She started respecting what her body needed. So I think in all three of these stories, it goes back to connection connection to not only the people around you on an emotional level, but connection, um, connection to yourself physically, and connecting to that other spiritual side. Um, and I, I mean, I think that's, I had one more thing to say, now I can't think of it. But Thank okay. you. And, it, and you see this, that like, it's, because it's connection, it can become disconnected, right? Yes. And it's a whole educational process, you know, and so especially the people you're looking at, it's the process has kind of gone awry in some sense, you know, right. and they need to be like re-educated. So I want to turn out to, to Karen LeBion, who's, who's kind of written and studied this extensively, so I wanted to know her thoughts on all of this. Thank you. And thanks to the two previous speakers. Those were wonderful stories. And I've also been asked to tell a personal story. And this is a story about our family and especially my two daughters who are actually here in the front row. They came with me today. And it's a story about how our family conquered picky eating. <laughs> oh. 
that. So my daughters are now <laughs> 9 and 13, but when they were, um, when they were born, I was a, an anxious young mother. My own mother had died when I was 12, and um, at the time, I didn't realize that a lot of the emotions I had around food and feeding were tied up with my own history. Uh, I had no time to think about that. I was, you know, the sleep deprivation, et cetera. Um, so as the, um, you know, as the time unfolded, we arrived at a situation when my younger daughter was a toddler and the older one was about kindergarten age, when they had become the classic North American picky eaters. So for, for those of you who have kids, you know what I'm talking about. It's like <laughs> Cheerios, it's white bread, and only one kind of white bread, maybe only one brand of white bread, <laughs> and uh, very few other foods. And I had no idea what to do about it, um, but as a kind of overachiever personality, I was fairly frantic about it. So luckily for me, uh, I say now, but at the time it didn't feel lucky. I was married, so my husband is a, a wonderful Frenchman. I met him when I was 23, so we've been married a long time. And um, at that po at point in our relationship, we moved to France um, from where we'd be living in Canada. And when we arrived in France, over the course of the year we lived there, my family uh, went through a, a, a transformation in our relationship to food. We developed a new relationship to food, and we, we conquered picky eating, as I like to say. But this was mostly in spite of me, not because of me. Um, and it was mostly due to the fact that we moved to my husband's home village, which is a small village in northern France on the north coast of Brittany, a very traditional conservative fishing village. The little church we got married in had this little... Um, you know, this little schooner hanging from the ceiling, and the priest goes out every year to throw a wreath into the water for the fishermen that might have died that year. So it's a small fishing community um, that was kind of skeptical of us, well, me in particular. <laughs> so we arrive, and the kids are at the local uh, preschool and the, and, and the school, and unbeknownst to me, my kids are about to undergo a French food education. Now, I had no idea such things existed. I, um, I, I had a busy relationship to food. I would shovel it in, you know, I would eat over my desk. I would, you know, it was an afterthought. We had snacks scattered everywhere, like in my pockets, in the glove compartment of the car, in the bag behind the stroller. And whenever the I thought the kids might be hungry, they got some more Cheerios and et cetera. So <laughs> all of this was about to be undone. And the, but the reason it was about to be undone is because for the French, Eating is like a secular sacrament. It's one of the most important things you do together, so important that in the place where we live, the shops all closed for two hours at lunch, and at school they took a two-hour lunch break to eat a meal prepared by a cook, a chef, who worked on the premises and who would walk around looking at the children eating and if they didn't eat would like wave the big ladle at them and the <laughs> teachers ate with them. I know this all sounds sort of uh, idyllic and bucolic, um, but there, the, the whole experience of this led me to be curious, and I began investigating the reason why the French have this relationship to food. And to make a long story short, in uh, about 100 years ago, 150 years ago, the French had one of the highest rates of infant mortality in Europe, and they were very concerned about it. And they began looking into this. So there's an enormous range of, of, of medical science uh, around the topic of how we develop a healthy relationship with foods. French psychologists have also looked at this in great detail. And they developed the first sort of science of early childhood care, which is called puericulture. And they distilled many common sense lessons, which I sort of distilled in the book as what I call the 10 French food rules, which we learned over the course of this year. So some of them are going to be very surprising to North American parents. One of them was no snacking. So when I say no snacking, I mean no eating between meals, and meals are at a set time. For, at six months old, they start, this, they start this routine, which is breakfast, lunch, and then a small mini meal called the goûter at around 4 o'clock, and then dinner at around 7 or 8. So, the, the, the powerful effect of not eating between meals means that these little tiny creatures are starving when they get to the meals, and they eat almost anything you put in front of them. <laughs> well, 
it's true. It's so it. What seemed to me like, frankly, child abuse. Like you're not, <laughs> you're you're not going to feed your child when they're hungry. It was actually a wonderful way of teaching them many important life lessons. One of them is the power of delayed gratification. For those of you who have heard about the marshmallow experiment, that famous experiment where you put the marshmallows in front of the kids and leave the room and say, if you eat one now, you that's all you get, but if you can wait until I come back, you get two marshmallows, right? And they follow the kids throughout their lives and find that the ability to delay gratification and wait for your two marshmallows is a better predictor of success than IQ. So the French teach delayed gratification to their kids through this relationship with food well before they start school. In fact, the French believe that you learn to eat just like you learn to read, except you do it earlier. And in this a process of learning to eat, you not only learn these life lessons for yourself, like delayed gratification, but you also learn what it is to live in a collective community. So one of the lovely French words for eating, to, the people who eat together, like we had breakfast together, the word is convive, which means living together and breaking bread together. And so when I say eating is a secular sacrament, I, it does feel that way. So there are certain rituals that bring the French to the table. Um, there's a time and a large amount of time, by our standards, taken to eat. Not much more time spent cooking, actually, which is interesting, but more time spent eating and conversing. And it is this, um, it is this pause in the day that marks our, our shared experience as a community, be it at work or at school or at home that opens up for lots of other wonderful life lessons. So the, the, uh, the transformation that our family went through wasn't only in what we ate. In fact, it was primarily in how we ate. Mm -hmm. And it's because we changed how we ate that the kids were more open to what they could start eating. So by the end of the year, they were eating spinach and mussels. And it was, it was a, a phenomenal transformation well beyond what I could have believed they would have been capable of doing. And I realized that I myself had been really the barrier to them achieving this. So as we explore this question of the friendly relationship to food, I think it's really interesting um, to question the own culture, you know, the cultures we all live in. We all bring different cultures, maybe from our own heritage to this conversation. North American culture offers us another kind of culture of perhaps busyness, food as an afterthought. And I think the emotional aspect that you identified is really key. So I'll just close with a couple of examples of this that really illustrate this. About 15 years ago, two scientists, one French and one American, did a big study of about 7,000 people in France and the US and the UK. And they wanted to understand people's attitudes to food. And one of the th questions they gave was they held up a big piece of delicious looking chocolate cake. And they asked people to offer the first words that came into their minds. And so what, take a second to do that. Imagine I'm showing you a beautiful piece of luscious chocolate cake. So what, what words come to mind? <laughs> so for um, uh, the, the most frequent words offered by Americans were guilt <laughs> and calories. And the most ah. frequent words offered by the French were celebration, ah. you know, delight. So the emotional attachment to uh, a, a food like a cake in France is not negative. Cake is delicious, we love to eat it. Salad is also delicious, and we love to eat that. Mm -hmm. So there are no good and bad foods. It's all good food. It's just that there's some foods we eat at every meal, and there's some foods we eat one in a while, perhaps associated with a ritual, like a birthday, etc. But then the, the guilt that often arises in our culture around good and bad foods doesn't emerge. So, so no guilt, no blame. It's a really important French food rule. Uh, another, and the final anecdote I'll close with, um, really relates to uh, the way in which the French teach their children about this question of feeling hungry. So the French tell their children, um, it's okay to have a comfortably empty stomach, and that's different than being hungry. And so many cultures do this, like the Japanese tell their kids to eat until they're 70% full. And so the notion that you can distinguish between my stomach is empty, but that's okay, versus I actually am really hungry, is a really powerful lesson. It allows us, when we're doing intuitive eating, to say, I'm, I don't need to eat yet, I'm okay. 
Um, and, and that sets you up for a lifetime also of, 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 of this healthy relationship where you can comfortably wait, comfortably space your meals, and then not feel guilty when you actually choose to eat. So I think this notion um, that uh, the emotions help us get more in touch with our body has been absorbed as common sense in France. And I don't want to blame people here, and I, in the end, didn't blame myself. We live in a culture where we don't learn these food rules. In fact, the culture sort of works against us in this all the time uh, eating uh, sort of culture that we've really grown since the 1970s. I think it didn't exist much before that. And so having a collective conversation about how we encourage the, these positive emotional associations with food um, and revive the family meal as really simple steps is, I think, um, like just a powerful way to bring that healthy relationship to food back to all of us and to our children. So I'll stop there. Good. Welcome to the So what we've been saying, so perhaps to answer the question then, the what does it mean to eat well, right? What's kind of emerging from this is to eat well means to eat in a, in a connected sense, right? That the connection and integration is, is crucial. The connection between the body and, uh, and the heart, you know, the connection between a person and another person. Uh, to eat well means to eat in a connected way, right? And to eat poorly means to be disconnected, mm -hmm. right? I think, and this is very interesting for me, like um, it's food, that leads to people, or like in, in Jose's example, it's, it's actually people that leads me back to food, right? So that they kind of rehabilitate each other, you know? And this connection can be lost culturally, it can be lost personally because of some issue, it can be lost any, you know, anywhere along the way, but it kind of like at any point of this chain, the connection can be regained, you know? The connection between people, between uh, uh, our bodies, you know? Um, even the connection that we have with God. You know? So I just want to kind of offer that, that summary. To me, what does it mean to eat well, and why do we not experience the joy? Well, it's because I'm, I'm eating uh, in a disconnected way. You know? And I'm, I feel very challenged by this. As you're saying, we all have problematic eating habits. I was writing down little notes for myself. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to open it back up to you if you have questions for each, for each other. Well, I have a question, actually, that I, I would love to hear your thoughts about, because uh, not that the French approach is better, but one of the things that they stress is having a, is having a routine, mm -hmm. eating at certain times of the day, and a lot of the American approach to healthy eating now seems to emphasize listening to your individual self as to when you yourself are hungry, the intuitive eating approach. Therefore, there is no general routine. There's your set of choices about when it's good for you to eat. Yeah, and I think that's interesting because when I would teach, when I would do the intuitive eating groups, people would, it would be kind of like, well, wait, but what if my family's eating? Mm -hmm. You know, I have to sit down with them. And I think you can always sit down, maybe you're not, I think what you said was a really, I really like that, I want to use that with my kids, the like, well, how hungry are you? You know, is it so hungry that you are going to fall over, you need to eat right away, or can you wait a little bit? Um, and I think, you know, it's okay to go to a meal and not be starving, but eat a little bit of what you feel like eating so that you're still connecting with people. You know, it doesn't have to be so black and white. I think another thing about um, society is that people go to extremes. So it doesn't have to be, I'm not eating at all, or I have to eat more than I want because I'm not hungry, but you could still sit down if you're at grandma's house and she's serving food and eat a little bit of what grandma made um, so that you're connecting. Mm -hmm. I think the question of portion size is really interesting. Yeah. So whenever I come to the States, even from Canada, the portions are three times the size of what we would get. Mm -hmm. They actually did this study mm -hmm. of McDonald's, those same scientists, and they looked at average portion sizes, and a serving of fries in Paris is like a third smaller than a serving mm -hmm. of fries in Philadelphia at McDonald's, like two McDonald's outlets. So the, and eating slower, because it takes about 20 minutes for the feeling of fullness to get from your stomach to mm -hmm. your brain. So the slower you eat, the less you eat, mm -hmm. which is kind of counterintuitive. So the longer you spend at the table, the less you're likely to eat if you're eating slowly. Mm -hmm. One of the things you said, Karen, that I thought um, in my own experience has been very important is as I reestablished my relationship with food was recognizing the importance of food on, on my body and taking the time to give it the respect that it needs. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is um, before 
for, for various reasons. I ate alone. I usually ate in my office. You know, I would go grab the food, go back to my office, and one hand with the food, the other hand on the keyboard. Um, changing that to taking, okay, I don't take two hours, but taking the time <laughs> to sit down and actually share a meal with somebody, a coworker, friends, my family, um, and, and just focusing on that, focusing on the people and focusing on the food, uh, in addition to obviously listening to your body. But I think that's very important is that, um, I mean, food is hugely important to our body and, and we can't ignore that. We can't just pretend like it's no big deal. Um, and giving that space and that time, I think, is um, very important. And I kind of just fell into that, but, I, but it's interesting to see that that's part of the French rules on, uh, on eating. I think that's, that's great. And that creates a different kind of intuition. So the, um, it, when they do international surveys, I thought it was so interesting that you mentioned like omega-3s and calories. So um, it's because it's very North American. So in, in, they, when they do surveys consistently, <laughs> the French know nothing about nutrition. You ask them how many calories are in a glass of milk, they have no clue. Um, so they have the lowest obesity rates in, in the developed world, actually in pretty much in the world because many middle class countries are now having similar obesity issues. Um, but they don't get to that low obesity rate through fear of calories. They have this intuitive sense of what it means to feed their bodies well, and they do that instead. So that's also an interesting thing, um, the notion that the more we focus on calories and fear, the harder it is to create and foster these healthy eating behaviors. I don't know if you found that. Yeah, well, I also amazing. think there's more, we put so many rules on the food here in our country that I think Look, I think people, humans want to rebel against the rules. So the more rules you put, the more they're going to rebel. So if, if we know all the calorie counts, that's great. But then someone might say, well, I'm going to go eat a whole chocolate cake in the closet because I haven't allowed myself to have it for so long. So I think sometimes people rebel against the rules where it sounds like in France, the rules take on a different form. Like there's less judgment. It's more just how the day is laid out? Well, or how does it? Let, so let, let, to answer that, I'll give you an example of what, how kids eat at school. So at schools in France, everyone eats at the cafeteria, the cantine. There are no vending machines. Uh, until the age of about 12, everyone gets one choice. That's it. It's either, uh, and in high school, they might get two choices. And um, the Ministry of Education governs the, the rules for the menus. So you, have, you can't have the same meal more than once a month. Um, it's fresh fruit four times a week, but a sweet, nice treat the fifth, right? So you get, uh, so you might have like nice pineapple one day or croissant the next day, but they're all, you know, nice. And um, they, they, the kids have to spend 35 minutes at the table, and the wow. teachers eat what the kids eat. So they're, so it sounds regulated. So I'm not sure that rules are always bad. Right. But again, I guess maybe rules is the wrong word. Routine. Yeah. Like a routine of. Of, yes, we always have dessert, but usually it's fruit, but we still like sweet treats and we get those. We know we'll get those once a week. I, I feel like the French approach provides some predictability, um, whereas the forbidden fruit approach in North America, like cake is bad, never eat it, sets you up for wanting to rebel. Right. Yeah, I would agree with that. Because that's what I think our, I think our food has, our society has so many rules around the food. like. Cake is bad, salad is good, omega-3s are good, you know, it's non-organic is not good. You know, there's like all these rules that people don't even know what to eat anymore. I also wanted to ask Jose something about what you just said about your relationship to food uh, being back in your body when you were eating, not just in your head. And I felt that came through when all of us were speaking. And I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Like this notion, it's what drew me to this panel was the notion that we'd be talking about head, heart, body, and spirit all being integrated as we engage in the daily act of eating. And I'd just love to hear more about how that transformed for you. Um, just to basically repeat what I, I was saying earlier is that um, for me, um, two parts. One is that in the past, um, I was listening to other people tell me what was wrong with me and basically saying, well, don't worry about that. Take this medicine and you'll be fine. Or don't worry about that. Have this procedure done. You'll be fine. 
Um, so I was not listening to me. I was listening to them. And, and, and changing that to say, well, wait a second. I hear what you're saying, but what I'm feeling doesn't, doesn't connect with what you're saying, so something's wrong. And paying attention to that was something that, that made a big difference. Uh, and the second part is um, that, I, that I really started deepening relationships um, with the people that understood the food the most, mm -hmm. which are the farmers. Um, the growers, the, you know, at, and I think that really um, made me appreciate the food in a way that I didn't before. Because one example that I didn't uh, touch on um, is that going to the farmers market, we've learned that that there is a rhythm to life uh, around food, which means for me that we can't get tomatoes in January because they don't sell them at the farmer's market because they are not grown. So we eat a lot of potatoes and squash right now, mm -hmm. and pumpkin, which my wife hates, but we, we eat those things. Um, and then in the summer, we eat lots of tomatoes because my wife loves tomatoes. <laughs> but um, it's learning to change our relationship and the rhythm um, that really has made things very interesting because uh, we have to change menus, we have to change everything about the way we eat depending on the season of the year. Yeah, well, I, wanna, I wanna say something about it too, because I think this is something that's kind of coming out, emerging with the body, you know, like the body has to be accepted on its own terms, mm -hmm. you know, not what I, what I think it ought to look like or feel like, you know, and that's actually very difficult to learn how to listen to that, you know, uh, which is a, a lot of what you're, what you're talking about, but food has to be like respected on its own terms, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm thinking like, for instance, one of the things we haven't kind of touched on is, is, like you say, you spend time to actually eat, to actually focus on the act of eating, but you also have to spend time preparing food, and real food takes a long time to yeah. prepare, but it, but it takes time because food has to be respected. Like I, remember I had a, a friend of mine came to my house a while back, and he brought me a chicken, right? And, uh, and he says, he says, hey man, you want, you want this chicken? I said, yeah. And he said, this is what a real chicken looks like, right? A real chicken. Not, not a chicken from a, 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 a factory farm in, in Arkansas, you know? A real chicken, it looks very different. You know how long it takes to pluck a chicken? A long time, <laughs> right? Oh yeah. So, you know, and, and so I think, I think Jose's point that like, to be connected with food itself, right? Real food imposes limits upon us. Like I can't eat chicken every day of the week because you know, you got to feed chickens, to eat chickens every day of the week. Okay, that's that's crazy. You know, food imposes a <laughs> limit, um, but if I embrace that limit and I say, okay, this is what a chicken is. You know, this is how it. This is the, you know, we don't have tomatoes in our summertime. It's to me, it's very similar. Accepting the limit of food is very similar to accepting the limit of the body. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you see that, even though it's not what I want it to be, it's actually more beautiful. It's actually, I mean, a real chicken. A real chicken is a, is a, is a special thing, you know, <laughs> that, that, like yellow fat, you know. So I just want to, to me, that's one of the things, like, if reality really is so promising, then why don't, why don't I, I don't give it the time that it takes and the effort that it takes to actually develop it, you know. Yeah, and I wonder about that. I wonder if reality is more out of our control, it perceived control, not that it really is. But so we, we get caught up in all these other things in our lives instead of being in what's real. Um, because maybe that feels scarier for mm -hmm. some reason. I think there's fear. I think there's also a throwaway culture where much is thrown away. Mm -hmm. many, many aspects of the physical world pass through our lives very quickly and they're thrown in the garbage heap or they're recycled or, so food is just one of those other things that you know, sort of comes by us with little appreciation, mm -hmm. a lot of speed onto the next thing. Mm -hmm. So it's also that, that notion I think that there is little in the physical world we actually are attuned to and mindful of mm. um, because we live in a culture of abundance or maybe the appearance of abundance mm -hmm. that I think it, it renders it particularly acute here in North America. Because again, I think we're talking very much about a specific, if you like, North American, um, dis, not disordered, disconnection, mm -hmm. which which you don't necessarily see in other cultures or it may manifest in other ways in right. other cultures. I remember I had friends in, in, in Haiti a while back, they were visiting and uh, what, what did people give them as they were like, you know, leaving, they gave them a chicken, you mm. know? So how are we gonna take this back home, you know? But, <laughs> but you know, but you're, but you're right, in, in, their, in, their, in their culture, right, this was, this was a great gift. You know, this was a great sign of, of, uh, of love, appreciation, something that was valuable, you know, that in America has no value, you know? 
I, I do think that part of the problem is we set ourselves up to think that eating real food requires a lot of time. Like, it's great to develop relationships with farmers. How many people have the time to do that? You know, or it's great to pluck the chicken, but are you kidding me? Like, so. I don't have, I don't have, I don't have kids to feed, though. Yeah, so, so this is it. So, but one of the things that I learned in France was um, the, the way people eat at home is very, very simple. My mother-in-law uses maybe six ingredients, you know, for, uh, to make the most wonderful meals. It, so, and the amount of time that French families spend cooking is only about 10 minutes longer than the average American family per week. Again, su yes, surprising, A, they do studies on this kind of thing, and B, that's the result. So that I, I feel like sometimes we have created a dichotomy between fast food culture, it's quick, it's cheap, and I just, my life is busy so I need to do it, versus real food, which takes hours, and there is kind of a happy medium where there are really simple, quick ways of cooking delicious, simple meals with few ingredients that we can also rediscover. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the key also, and then uh, of, rather than saying there's good, which is incredibly expensive and time consuming, like organic or omega 3s and then there's bad, right? There is this other way, which is this relationship way about, hey, it's, um, artichoke season, I'm just gonna hang out, you know, figure out a simple way to cook the artichokes and maybe they'll taste pretty plain, but I'm just gonna enjoy the artichoke. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's one kind of connection that we haven't kind of explored yet, I just wanna kind of hear your thoughts. Because we see this, that to be, if I'm not connected with my body, right, it's really, it, it's impossible to, to enter into a connection with someone else, right? Or, you know, if we didn't eat together, if families don't eat together, you know, this connection is very difficult to make. So all these different connections, but I'm thinking of this too, this is something that, that kind of emerges kind of naturally, I think, but it can be missing. Right? We've kind of touched on what is the connection with, with God, right? If, how can I be connected to what transcends, you know, the created world if I'm disconnected from creation itself? Or how can I be connected to the one who is the source of, of love and unity if, you know, if I'm not connected to those that I'm with? So what, I mean, for as, as Christians, I'm, I'm, I think of this uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, one of the signs of the Christian community is that they eat their meals differently, right? With joy and gratitude. Mm -hmm. So is there a connection that we need to be mindful of? You know, it's interesting working with people with eating problems, and this is something I've always wanted to study if, if I had a chance to go back to school again, but um, there was really a lack of spirituality that I saw. Like a lot of them either didn't believe in God or didn't believe in any sort of higher power and I always thought that was something about not trusting. To have faith, you have to trust. You have to kind of give yourself over. If you don't trust your body, if you don't trust the people around you, if you don't trust that you're gonna be taken care of or that you can take care of yourself, it can be hard to make that leap of faith. Um, but I do think like in my last example, she started to trust herself again and that led her back to a spiritual path. So maybe it is about maybe you have to make some of these basic connections to make all the connections happen. Right, faith, faith requires one to be connected even, even from the get-go. Right. Mm -hmm. I feel like people thirst for a sense of integrity and authenticity in a culture that often doesn't offer them that, and that living in integrity is deepened when you integrate on a daily basis, you know, head, heart, body, and spirit. And there are very few safe spaces in which to do this in the culture. Mm -hmm. And um, there are actually not many uh, discussions in not only Christian, but other spiritual communities of how food supports the search for the spiritual. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're question is a good one, but I'm, I've been thinking about it, and I'm not sure that we offer ourselves very good answers. I mean, I'll go back again to what I said about the French approach treating food as a secular sacrament, in the sense that um, there is a, a deliberate sense of um, this collective communal act of being very central to French citizenship. And in fact, the French state views this as one of the key aspects um, of teaching people to be French. Right. It's even, they've even classified it UNESCO World Heritage, the French family meal, right? Um, all of that is substitutes for, um, or actually um, kind of deviates, I think, 
um, France from a very serious conversation they need to have about secularism versus their Catholic traditions, especially in an increasingly like multicultural and diverse society. So um, I don't think they have the answers to your question either, actually. So um, it, it feels like that's an opening that many people are currently exploring. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you might uncover from your own traditions. Well, I, I mean, I have, I have a couple of thoughts, right? One of them is, for, is from uh, my own family. So we have a lot of little kids in my family. Okay, so meal times are like lots of little kids. And um, so my sister was putting the two and a half year old to bed the other day and they're going through their prayers. We pray for grandma and granddaddy and, you know, pray for all these people. Uh, and so they pray the Our Father and they say, you know, okay, we pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. And she adds, bless the cook right? Because this is how we pray. So to me, it, it's kind of struck me that gratitude, right? To eat well, if, if I eat well, but I'm not full of gratitude, right? Thank you. So whoever, whoever prepared this for me, thank you, because I enjoy it, right? It, 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 it's good. To, to be filled with something good and not to have anyone to thank is, is to be disconnected, mm -hmm. you know? And you thank the cook. You got to thank grandma because she made that for you, right? But you know, when we go out into the world and we, it's, the world is so full of, of wonderful things, artichokes, wonderful, so strange, you know? Thank you, whoever you are, right, that gave us these things. I mean, to me, um, if I can't, if I don't pray out of gratitude, then what am I, how am I gonna pray, mm. you know? Uh, there's, a, there's a passage, maybe we'll kind of end with this, there's a passage in uh, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Two Towers, if you remember, you read The Two Towers, mm -hmm. where the, the hobbits have been captured uh, by the, uh, the Dunedain, okay, and um, Faramir has them, he's captured them, and they're going to eat a meal together, so they bring out their stores, and they're eating, of course, the hobbits love to eat, and so they're, they're very excited about this. And uh, Faramir explains to them the traditions of their, their people, that when we, I can't, I can't quote it, but when we eat, we look to the west, to the undying lands, and those that lie beyond that, and we acknowledge, you know, Iluvatar or something. And the hobbits are very impressed by that. And he says, do you have similar customs where you come from, right? And, and uh, I don't know which of the hobbits he says. He says, well, where we come from, we say please and thank you, and we always thank our host. <laughs> so I, I do think that, that gratitude, if gratitude does not emerge from our eating and drinking, then we cannot be said to be eating well. So it's, with gratitude, I want to thank all of our speakers, Jose Porto, Jimmy Laracy, and Karen LeBion.